20. So we only have one more Saturday in August. And I'm thinking to myself, where in the world did the year go? My, 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 where on earth did this year go? Anyway, we are in chapter three. Chapter three is the last of the chapters in this book that is going to concern itself with step number one. Step number one being the only step that we must work perfectly. The, the alcoholic is either drinking or they're not. The drug addict is either taking drugs or not. The gambler is either gambling or not. And with us, it has to be very, very clear cut. We're either eating our alcoholic foods or we are not. And on page 30 of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it says we, had, we learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. So a lot of people will ask, and I'm reviewing and we'll get to where we are, but people will ask, how do I work the first step? Well, the answer is you don't. The first two steps are conclusions of the mind. Actually, the third step is a decision, so there's no real action involved in steps one, two, and three. The first step that we're going to come to where there's any action involved really is going to be step four. But the bottom line is that concession of the mind that we concede to our innermost selves that we are alcoholics is the first step in recovery and it is extremely extremely important that we take that step right here in our in our gederim gederim is a yiddish word for your guts your neshuma is your holiness your spirit you can take it at the level of your neshuma you can take it at the level of your gederim but right here and right here is where that concession must go where you have conceded to your innermost selves that you are indeed an alcoholic. You are indeed a compulsive overeater. Now we know from the doctor's opinion, Bill's story, chapter two and chapter three, that the disease has two characteristics. It is an allergy of the body and it is a twist of the mind. The mind being the more important thing because the mind is what sets everything into motion. The, the main problem of the alcoholic, we are taught in chapter two, centers in his mind rather than in his body. The reason is the mind is what sets up the action. The action is what, when we take the food in, that will set us up with the allergy. Why would somebody take food into their mouth when they know that it has been killing them for a long, long time? And the reason is, as Dr. Silkworth tells us, and as the stories that we're studying in this chapter tell us, that the mind is looking for a way of alleviating itself from that pain of not eating. And not eating can be, is, is very, very painful unless we are acted upon by the steps. We are blessed to have this program because until this program was formulated and Bill Wilson, who knew the problem and was still drinking, and Ebby Thatcher, who knew a solution but didn't know the problem, until it came together, we had nothing. We had a series of diets. We had a series of the exercise of willpower to try to fend off that idea that we wanted to eat, drink, drug, or do whatever it is that we're addicted to. And in that confluence of the of Ebby and Bill, we have that confluence. What is a confluence? It's actually when rivers run together. And when rivers run together, they form a river that is more powerful, more magnificent than either of the tributaries. And when the tributaries came together, the knowledge of, this, of the problem that Bill had, 
the knowledge of the solution that Ebby had when the tributaries came together in a confluence. And that confluence sprung forth and gave us the program that we have today. We have something that will be around 20,000 generations into the future. This program will live forever. Why will this program live forever? Because it works. Page 88, one of the most important paragraphs ever written in the English language in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous on page 88 of the big book, it says, it works. It really does. And of the people that are here, so far we have 82 people that are here this morning. Of the 82 people that are here, many, many of those people breathe, eat, drink, walk. They are living examples that this program indeed works. And there's many, for as many faces as we see, for as many people as are enumerated in the participants part of our uh, work here, there are as many miracles as we can see. Every one of you is a living, breathing miracle. It's just a miracle because this disease has two traits, two characteristics, but it has three factors to it, three very important factors. And the disease is permanent. It is never eradicated. What I have is a daily reprieve contingent upon my spiritual growth, my spiritual condition, actually. I have a daily reprieve, right? Because if I stop working the steps, as horrible as my life was in the food, as lonely as my life was in the food, as physically, mentally, emotionally tortured as my life is in the food, living completely asexually for decades of my life. I went on my first date. I was 35 years of age. I was physically deformed because of this disease. I had a fat overhanging stomach by the time I was 10, 11, 12 years old. Um, as embarrassed as I was when people would call me fatso and people in public would ridicule me and children would laugh at me when I was an older, much more obese adult. I was an object of ridicule. I was an object of, of, of ridicule no matter where I went, no matter what I did. There didn't seem any place on earth where I could escape. And it was very traumatic to be me because I couldn't stand, I couldn't sit, I couldn't walk, I couldn't get in and out of a car, I couldn't really do the things that people do. And I was physically and I was emotionally emasculated by this disease. From the time I was about 10 or 11 years old, I was physically and I was emotionally emasculated by this disease. So this disease has been a horrible nightmare in my life, a very horrible, horrible nightmare. Now, the reason that I'm bringing this out, and there's nothing new here, there's nothing new. I've talked about this every week that we've been together, pretty much. The reason that I'm telling you this again today is I wanna illustrate the point. See, the disease is permanent. The disease is progressive. That means it gets worse over time, never better. And the disease is fatal. Now, when I say that it is progressive, what I mean by that is it gets worse and worse over time. And in the illustrations that we've read so far, we've talked in this chapter, we have talked about uh, Jim. We've talked about a man of 30. We've talked about the jaywalker. And we're also going to talk about today, we're gonna to start the story of Fred. And Fred is gonna illustrate for us from kind of another perspective, this, what, this permanent progression and fatality of the disease. And so the reason that I'm bringing out all the horrible things that this disease has done to me is not to illustrate how hideous the disease is because most of you know how hideous it is or you wouldn't be on the line right now listening. The reason I'm bringing it up is because no matter how many of these I've done 
no matter how I've been around the world doing Big Book, no matter how many retreats and how many conventions I've done, here's the bottom line, boys and girls. I will go back to the food again if I do not continue to work these steps and to give away what I have learned. You do not you do not learn this program by absorbing spiritual information. You will get this program by transmitting spiritual information. And this is very important. Why will I go back to the food? Will it be something where I say to myself, you know, maybe those Rice Krispie treats, those Chips Ahoy's or those whatever, maybe maybe this time it won't hurt me. I won't say that to myself. I know better than that. What I will say to myself is, I can't take the pain anymore. Screw it. Screw it. I'm just going to eat. And because eating will become a step up from where I am. Eating will be a step up from where I am because when I'm not eating and I'm not working the steps, I am restless, irritable, and discontented. Throw in scared to death, jealous as anything, lustful, angry, all these various things. And these, the buildup of these emotions will make my brain scream out for a solution. And every day there's two solutions in front of me. Two, I can, to, to get rid of the pain, I can work the steps or I can eat the food. The eating of the food is what I practiced for decades of my life. And the eating of the food gets rid of the pain for about nine, eight, nine to 10 seconds. And then the pall, the horror of my life will come in and the guilt, the shame, and the remorse of what I've done to myself will come in, and I'll want to stop eating, but I won't be able to. And the reason that I won't be able to stop eating is because by taking that Rice Krispie treat into my body, by taking that piece of pizza into my body, which is the most intimate relationship you can possibly have. You can have a sexual relationship with another human being, you can have a relationship with money or drugs or whatever, but I am taking something into my body and making it a part of my body inside of me. What could be more intimate than that? But once I've done that, I will release the power of the physical allergy. So I have a mental twist that says, eat the food. I have a mental blank spot, which is the built-in forgetter, and that built-in forgetter will never allow me to bring into consciousness the thought of what the food does to me. It will only allow me to focus in on what the food is going to do for me. And I have the steps, which will do the same thing for me that the food did. It will give me what? It'll give me the effect. That effect is the sense of ease and comfort that comes instantly by eating the food. And so the food works and the steps work. The food has horrible, nightmarish beyond nightmarish consequences to your health, to your psyche, to your families, to your friends, to the people closest to you who are watching you eat yourself to death. As you watch the person eating themselves to death and they start circling that drain and we start becoming very, very scared for that person. Now, not all of us will gain weight to that level. And let's bring in something that is applicable to some of you, maybe not all of you, but some of you. I have at least a couple of friends. One lives in a mountainous area and one lives in Northern California and they do not gain weight the way I do when they're in the disease. They don't have the same kind of disease characteristic that I have. They are on the anorexic side and they will 
get that effect. They will get that, um, they will get that high, that effect by restricting the amount of food that they are eating. And they are people who, if you saw them, you would never look at them and say, oh my God, this is a person that has an eating disorder. Or, oh my God, this is a person who has, you know, who is a compulsive overeater. You'd never say that in a million years because they don't look that way, but they are. They are dumpster diving, gutter, back alley, compulsive overeaters. They just don't gain weight like I do. They are anorexics. And there are also people on the line today that have a home in OA that are bulimics. And there's three primary types of bulimia. There is, sorry, there are people who purge through vomiting and they are regurgitants. They are regurgitants. And that is a form of bulimia. What that means is to regurgitate means to throw up and they will induce vomiting uh, on their bodies. Uh, and and they'll, they'll, there's various ways for them to do that. And these regurgitants are compulsive overeaters, just like I am, just like any of us are. And do they have a home here in OA? You bet they do. There are also two other primary forms of bulimia, and that is exercise bulimia. My very good friend who lives in uh, a mountainous area here, just a little north, one state north of, of Arizona. She is an exercise bulimic. And if you looked at her, you'd never know that there was something going on there because she looks like a movie star. So does the one in Northern California. But you, you'd think she was like a movie star or something. But what she would do is she would eat massive quantities of food and then after eating massive quantities of food, she would actually go to the gym for six, seven hours at a time, and she would stress her skeleton, stress out her muscles, her ligaments, exercising way beyond what a human being is, should be doing. The third type of bulimia uses laxative. They are laxative bulimics. We have regurgitants, we have laxative bulimia, and we have exercise bulimia. And those are the three most common forms of bulimia. And a lot of times the people that are anorexic do present as having some distress because they get overly thin, and sometimes they do not. So it just depends. You can't judge a book by its cover in this program, in any program really, you cannot judge a book by its cover. You just don't know. And that's why this is a self-diagnosing disease. And the reason that I want to bring this up is because I want to make sure that whoever you are, whatever form of compulsive overeater that you happen to be, that you understand you have a home, not only here at my big book sessions, at our big book sessions, but you have a home in OA. And I think that that's very important to bring out because sometimes the anorexic, sometimes the bulimic, they kind of feel like they don't always fit in. So I like to go out of my way to make sure, welcome, you are one of us, and we're so glad that you're here. We're sorry about this, we used to say this in meetings in Chicago, we're so sorry about the circumstances which brought you here, but we're glad that you're here, and we hope that you'll hear a solution here to the problem that you suffer from because they are in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so what we have here is more about alcoholism. That, that's the chapter that we're in right now. And in more about alcoholism, we are gonna draw from the knowledge that was given to us by Richard Peabody, who in 1930 wrote a book called The Common Sense of Drinking. So vital was this book, The Common Sense of Drinking, that Bill Wilson's copy of this book is in the AA archives as we do this this morning. Very, very important. And the three things that Richard Peabody imparted on us are that the disease is permanent, the disease is progressive. That means that it gets worse over time, never better and the disease is unfortunately fatal. And that's, that's the three 
uh, traits of the illness that Peabody teaches us, and that's something that we have to keep in mind. That every day when I wake up in the morning, if I'm lucky enough to wake up in the morning, three things have happened. I got older, which means I'm less able to fend off the effects of excess food. I got older and um, the disease has progressed and things are changing. Every day, things are changing. Six months ago, a year ago, could any of you that are on the line right now have told me what COVID-19 was? I doubt it. Unless you were some sort of research scientist or something, I doubt if any of you could have told me what COVID-19 was. And I doubt if any of you six months ago or a year ago could have foreseen that this year would be a year unlike any other year that we've ever had. Could any of you have thought to yourself last year, could any of you have thought, wait, there's not going to be a college football season this year in most parts of the country. The baseball season is going to be cut to 60 games. I'm using sports analogies because I'm familiar with that. But there's a whole panoply, a whole assortment of things that have happened in 2020 that are unprecedented things. So every day that I wake up, I am older, the disease has progressed, and things are changing. And as I get older, as the disease progresses, and as things are changing, I must take more and more effort to get out of myself and help others because when I don't help others, when I don't think of others first, I am in the clutches of the disease. I am in the clutches of this, uh, of this illness. So every single day is a day when I must bring God's will into all of my activities. It is vital for my survival to remember that this is a disease which requires constant vigilance, constant work. Okay, where we're going to start today is on page 38. And on page 38, at the very bottom of the page is where we left off. And the paragraph that we're going to start with, hang on a second. I have an extremely good air conditioner at my house. And when I moved into this house, I didn't replace the air conditioner because it wasn't that old. I replaced the guts of it, the compressor and the condenser. I replaced those. And I can really chill it down in here to, to a cold level. But you know what? It's still 94 degrees here. And it is just, it is just butt kicking hot outside there. And I don't care how cool I have it in the house. It's butt kicking hot out there. And if I don't go through at least a gallon of water, I'm in trouble. So please bear with me. It's very, very hot here in the desert. Okay. It says, some of you are thinking, yes, what you tell us is true, but it doesn't fully apply. Now, what are we going back to? We're going back to the story that we ended with last week of the jaywalker. And in the jaywalker, just to jump back a paragraph to give us continuity, it says here, you may think our illustration is too ridiculous. I'm page 38 and I'm up a paragraph here. You may think our illustration, illustration of what? The illustration of the jaywalker is too ridiculous, but is it? We who have been through the ringer have to admit if we substituted alcoholism for jaywalking, the illustration would fit us exactly. However intelligent we have been in other respects, where alcohol has been involved, we have been strangely insane. It's strong language, but isn't it true? Yes, it is. The most insane thing I've ever done, and I've done some pretty crazy things, but the most insane thing I've ever done in my life is just let's pretend this is a candy bar. I have taken my arm and I have moved a candy bar, which has emasculated me, embarrassed me, cut me off from society, cut me off from health, 
cut me off from going to any normalcy in my life. And I have taken that candy bar and put it in my mouth and made it part of my body. That is the most insane thing I've ever done. Why would somebody do something like that? Because the pain of not eating is just too much for me to bear. I cannot bear it without God. Okay, some of you are thinking, bottom of 38, yes, what you tell us is true, but it doesn't fully apply. We admit we have some of these symptoms, but we have not gone to the extremes you fellows did, nor are we likely to, for we understand ourselves so well after what you told us that such things cannot happen again. We have not lost everything in life through drinking, and we certainly do not intend to. Thanks for the information. Kiss my toughest. No, sorry. But what the bottom line here is that we have fended off this solution until we were ready to come in. Many of us knew about OA or had been to OA meetings and made a decision to stay out. Or we knew what we needed to do. We were unwilling to do it. Why would we do that? The reason is the ego. The ego, make me right, make me different, and make me feel good right now. Let's focus in on the second thing that the ego does. The first thing the ego does is make me right. Then it says make me different and then makes me feel good right now. Make me different from everybody else. And the ego says to me, they don't understand me. I'm different. Somehow I'm different. And you've all said that to yourself because you were the only one that was abused or you were the only one that had lived through whatever, you have told yourself numerous times that somehow you are different. And every one of us here, and there's 96 of us right now, every one of the 96 of us here right now has looked up at the sky through tears in our eyes and mourned the loss of somebody that we loved and we lost them to alcoholism or compulsive overeating. My mother literally ate herself to death. Smoking, my father smoked himself to death. Every one of us here has suffered these horrible losses of addiction. And we have stood in the funeral parlors. We have stood on the cemetery grounds and we have said to ourselves, my God, what a shame. He was so young. She was so young. They had everything to live for. Why did they do something like that? And on the way home from that cemetery, on the way home from that funeral, on the way home from that situation, we ourselves have gone someplace and gorged ourselves with food. That is the nature of what this is, and it's never going to change. Are you waiting for the illness to change? It's not going to. The illness is not going to change. We are the ones that have to start working our programs better and stronger than ever. Top of 39. That may be true of certain non-alcoholic people who though, though drinking foolishly and heavily at the present time are able to stop or moderate. And there are people that you know that maybe drank their way or drugged their way through college and they put it down and they don't understand why we can't. They were not true drug addicts. They were not true alcoholics. They were people who were heavy users of drugs and alcohol for a period of time, but given sufficient reason, they could stop altogether or moderate. I have friends of mine, and you do too, and they can eat like the Dickens, or they can drink like the Dickens, but the next day, they don't even think about it. I've told this story many, many times. I have a friend of mine, he lives in Chicago, which is where I'm born and raised. I'm from Chicago. He and I could go to a buffet <clears throat> right now. I don't even think they have buffets anymore because of the COVID, because of the COVID-19, but let's just say that they did. We could go to a buffet restaurant and he could out eat me. He has a hollow leg or something. This guy is skinny. 
he's probably never weighed more than about 175 pounds in his entire life. And when we were kids, he was like a stick. He was like a, a twig, constantly moving, basketball, baseball, whatever it was, constantly. And he could out eat me at the buffet. Now here's the difference. It's Saturday morning. He isn't gonna think about eating now until Monday. He's not gonna eat any more today. He's not gonna eat any food tomorrow. He might have a piece of fruit or something tomorrow. That's about it. He knows he ate heavily on Saturday morning. He's not interested in food. He's done, okay? I'm going to eat on the way home from the buffet. I'm going to go to the convenience store. I'm going to go to the, the donut shop. I'm going to go someplace where I can get a sugar fix after eating at that buffet because what did I do at the buffet? I triggered my physical allergy. Now, he out ate me but I triggered the physical allergy. He doesn't have the physical allergy to trigger. He doesn't have it. There's nothing for him to trigger. His brain and his body is not damaged like mine. Let's continue. Because their brains and bodies have not been damaged as ours were. They are, we are different from them. And I just got through criticizing this feeling that we're different because I gotta finish the statement here but we are the same as the people in here. They may look different. They may manifest the disease differently, but we are the same. We have a brain and a body that are damaged beyond repair. The only thing we can do is work the steps of the program and effect through the working of the steps a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps. I don't refer to a spiritual experience because I've never had one. I've never had this sudden and profound spiritual experience. And just to save us time during Q&A, a spiritual experience is sudden and profound like Bill had in the hospital, and a spiritual awakening is slow in developing. That's all it is, but it gets you to the same place. I never had a spiritual experience. I've had a spiritual awakening that came about through the working of the steps so that today these foods do not enter my mind. And as they don't enter my mind, they do not enter my body. If they don't enter my mind, they will not enter my body. And what is it I need to do so that they don't enter my mind? I need to work the steps. Once again, I'm going to repeat this because it's vital to our survival and we have been pre-programmed to forget it. We will not get this program by absorbing spiritual information. We will get the program by transmitting spiritual awake, a spiritual information. So the point of this is, again, we must work with others. We must transmit what we have been given. Let's continue. With hardly an, uh, but the actual or potential alcoholic, with hardly an exception, will be absolutely unable to stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge. I would be willing to bet, be willing to bet you, that if we went on Jeopardy or we went on any game show you name, there are 101 of you here. I bet you I could call out five of you because that's how many they have on a team uh, on some of the game shows or three of you because that's how many people play Jeopardy or what. I think there's three, three players for Jeopardy. But anyway, whether there's three or a thousand doesn't mean a thing. There are people here at this big book meeting right now where if I had the category of nutrition, you could not be beat. I wouldn't be among them because I'm not an expert at it, but I know one thing, some of you are like PhD nutritionists. You know more about the caloric content of food than a nutritionist does. I bet you if I said extra large egg, you'd know that that was 70 calories. Apple, peach, whatever it is. You guys would know this like you know your name. 
that knowledge of what's good for you, what's not good for you, is not going to help you. We are unable to stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge. What did Bill say? So that was it. Self-knowledge would fix it. But it was not, for the frightful day came when I drank once more. My moral declining fell off like a ski jump. Isn't that what he says in Bill's story? You bet it is. <laughs> so the basis of self-knowledge is not going to get me where I need to be. It's just not going to. This is a point we wish to emphasize and re-emphasize, to smash home upon our alcoholic readers and has, as it has been revealed to us out of bitter experience, let's take another illustration. Now, before we read Fred, let's give you some real life application here. The person that we're really talking about in the story of Fred is Harry Brick. Just like you build your house, the three little pigs, Brick. Okay, Harry Brick was a CPA in the 1930s. And he was wealthy, he was successful. Now the reason that this is a very important story is, Jim was kind of up against it. You know, he lost his car agency through drinking. The man of 30, he was very successful in business. He promised himself after a while that if he was successful in business, he could go back and drink. Out came his carpet slippers and pipe and he was dead within four years. Okay, the jaywalker, we don't know, but a lot of these guys think, or a lot of people think, alcoholic. Oh, the guy must be up against it. He's wearing a trench coat. He's laying in the gutter, and he's drinking cheap whiskey out of a bottle covered up in a, in a brown paper bag, right? Isn't that the illustration you kind of have in your head? This Fred is a partner is going to smash through that that identity or that idea that you have in your head that alcoholics fit a certain description. They don't. Just like I'm telling you about my friends, just like I'm telling you about some of these other people, we don't all fit into a certain description. We're not all extremely morbidly obese. We're not. We're not all extremely thin. We're not. We're somewhere in the middle. We are somewhere between this extreme and that extreme. But if you have that physical allergy, and if you have that twist of the mind, you are a compulsive overeater, no matter how extreme your case may be. Harry Brick also loaned Bill money to get the big book printed in April of 39. His story appears in the first edition of the big book, and it's under the name A Different Slant. And the reason that it's called a different slant is because he, Harry, was very, very financially successful. Now, you don't always throw that in. When you think of an alcoholic in your mind, you don't often think the person might be very successful. There are people here that are financially successful. I'm not rich, but my bills are paid. And there are people here who are up against it financially. And there are people here who have beautiful incomes. None of it's going to help you. Remember when we do the ABCs, when we do chapter five, and we think about Karen Carpenter, and we think about James Gandolfini, and we think about Fatty Arbuckle, and we think about President uh, Taft, and we think about uh, John Candy and Chris Farley. What do all these people have in common? They are financially and professionally highly successful people, yet their compulsive overeating cut them down and took them out. This disease does not care who it takes out. It doesn't care what it does to you. This disease will rob you. It will it will rob you of years of your life and it will kill you in the most unmerciful way that you could possibly imagine. It will do things to drag you through pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. This disease doesn't care who it kills and it doesn't care what it does to you on the way to hell. It doesn't care. 
the disease is a terrorist. It is a merciless terrorist. And this is what you're up against. And every single time we let a day go by, when we don't do the service that we need to do, we don't do the step work that we need to do, we don't do the work necessary to make this job one in our life. I don't want to hear, I've got kids, I've got a business, I've got a full-time job, I've got this. I've, you've got a disease. And your disease doesn't care that you have kids. Your disease doesn't care that you're well-intentioned. This disease doesn't care about your friend's wedding. It doesn't care about any of these things. This disease will take you out in the back and it will beat you unmercifully before it kills you. Death will be a step up from the way you're living as you circle the drain. There is a solution and the solution is in the steps. Let's talk about Fred and let's see where we, what we can learn here from Fred. Fred is a partner. Oh, by the way, one other thing about Harry Brick. He had to sue AA to get his money back. He loaned Bill money to get the big book printed. But when the big book was printed on April the 10th, 1939, you couldn't give it away. You, could you imagine going back now to April the 10th, 1939, and if you bought a couple of copies of this book for $3.50, you know that now, excuse me, if you have, now this is, this is a fourth edition. If you were holding a 1-1, one, one, which I have one, a first edition, first printing copy of the, that book, it would be worth $50,000, $60,000 right now in good condition. If, if you had one, it would be worth 50, 60 grand Easy. If it's in good condition, you could probably get more. The extradition papers on Ebby Thatcher, remember we've told the story about how Ebby was extradited. Uh, he signed extradition papers. He went to New York with Roland and um, he went to roll with Roland and Sieber Graves Jr. to New York, but he signed the extradition papers. What are extradition papers? He is signing a paper that says, he is agreeing with the judge that if he does not do what these men are asking him to do, he will be immediately extradited back to the state of Vermont for placement in Brattleboro Insane Asylum. Those papers just sold online to a man in Southern California for $55,000 for those papers. $55,000 is one of the TV producers that bought it. And he, he paid a lot of money for those papers. Could you just imagine, though, if you could go back? Anyway, Fred is a partner in a well-known accounting firm. His income is good. He has a fine home, is happily married, and the father of promising children of college age. Not exactly the, the profile of what you have in your head of an alcoholic, is he? No. He has so attractive a personality that he makes friends with everyone. If ever there was a successful businessman, it is Fred. To all appearance, he is a stable, well-balanced individual, yet he is alcoholic. You see, alcoholism is no respecter of success. It's no respecter of your station in life. Compulsive overeating is not a respecter of this either. Compulsive overeating doesn't care that you're a lawyer. It doesn't care that you're a housewife. It doesn't care that you are a bookbinder or a, or a, or a, a person who is a tailor or a, it doesn't care. This disease will cut you down. It doesn't care that you've got beautiful children that need you. It doesn't care. We first saw Fred about a year ago in a hospital where he had gone to recover from a bad case of jitters. It was his first experience of this kind and he was much ashamed of it. Far from admitting he was an alcoholic, he told himself he came to the hospital to rest his nerves. We see lots of nerve resters in OA, don't we? We see a lot of people that are in the meetings and maybe they're here now, I don't know. They're, they're kind of resting their nerves, but they're gonna listen and they're gonna sort of look into the window here, but they're not gonna carry it out into action. 
you have to carry what we're talking about into some action because this is not a program for people who need it. This is not a program for people who want it. It's a program for people who do it. It's an action program. Without action, faith without works is dead. The doctor intimated strongly that he may be worse than he realized. I spent my life thinking I'm not as bad as, as they're telling me. I was 17 years old. I was a junior at Mather High School in Chicago, Illinois, and I broke my ankle in gym class. And I had to go to Edgewater Hospital in Chicago, which isn't there now, that building is condos. But I went to Edgewater Hospital with my mother and Dr. Bernstein was my doctor. He looked down his, over his glasses like this. I can see him doing it now. And he said, you know, Virginia, my mother's name was Virginia. That's not a name you hear anymore. My mother's name was Virginia. He says, you know, Virginia, he isn't gonna live to see 30. He's 17 years old, he's over 300 pounds. He isn't gonna live to see 30 years of age. And my mother started crying in the emergency room, which is where they casted you. I was put into a cast. They don't do it in the emergency room anymore. And the doctors certainly don't do it. It's the nurses that do it now. But the doctor was screaming at my mother about, why are you letting him eat this? And why are you letting him eat so much? And you've got to put him on a diet. And you've got to this and you've got to that. Guess what me and my mother did on the way home from the hospital? Hand to God. Hand to God. We went for ice cream. Hand to God. We went for ice cream. My mother was a compulsive overeater who was scared. I was a compulsive overeater. I was in physical pain and I was scared. We went for ice cream on the way freaking home from the hospital. For a few days, he was depressed about his condition. He made up his mind to quit drinking altogether. He made up his mind to quit drinking means he was going on a diet. It never occurred to him that perhaps he could not do so in spite of his character and standing. Fred would not believe himself an alcoholic, much less accept a spiritual remedy for his problem. In other words, Fred would not take step one and, and believe himself an alcoholic. If you don't take step one, you don't need step two. And step two is to accept a spiritual remedy for your problem. We told him what we knew of alcoholism. What did they tell him, boys and girls? They told him of the mental twist, and they told him of the physical allergy. That's what they knew about alcoholism. He was interested <clears throat> and conceded that he had some of the symptoms <clears throat> but he was a long way from admitting that he could do nothing about it himself. And what do we say to ourselves so many times as we stand in our first meeting, as we stand in our second meeting, as we stand in our third meeting, and for many, many people in OA, there's about a 15 year gap between their first meeting and their second meeting. They come in, they see what goes on, maybe they come to a few meetings, and then they leave, they bolt out, and they go out and they're usually gone for 10 to 15 years before they come back. Sometimes the timing is shorter, sometimes the timing is longer. But we were a long way from admitting we could do nothing about it himself. Because what have people been filling your head with from the time you were a little kid? They were telling you a lie. They were telling you something that was true for them, but not true for you. They're telling you, you can do this on your own. They're telling you that if you pull yourselves up by the bootstraps, young lady, if you pull yourself up by the bootstraps, young man, you could do this. All it takes is you pushing yourself away from the table. And we think at some point that losing weight will solve the problem and it will not. You see, losing weight is not going to solve the problem. You understand that losing weight is not going to solve the problem. Did I mention that losing weight is not going to solve the problem? Because the problem is not in how much you weigh. 
The problem is in what you're feeling and what you're thinking as the result of what you're feeling. And the mind, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. And when the mind is fettered by pain from guilt and shame and remorse and fear and anger, and the mind is lustful and the mind is happy or the mind is whatever it is, these feelings will drive us into the food because food will become a step up from where we are. Did I mention that losing weight will not solve the problem? Because there's people that think losing weight will solve the problem and losing weight does not solve the problem. You have lost weight in the past and have returned to the food. You have gotten down to that goal weight. Maybe you only stayed there for 15 minutes. Maybe you only stayed there for the length of the wedding until the buffet came out, and then you started eating like there was no tomorrow. You have fit into the garment. You have been the weight that you wanted to be or close to it at times in your life. And once again, losing weight does not solve the problem. But in our, un, unfetter, in, our, in our crazy minds, our insane minds, if we just lose weight on our own, then we don't need this Fakakta program. We have to surrender to this idea that we need the program above all else. That there is nothing in this world that I can put in front of my program. Yes, I was a husband. Yes, I was a father. Yes, I have a, a business that I own. Yes, my business is demanding of my time. Yes, my daughter was demanding of my time. Yes, my wife was demanding of my time. I am not unfamiliar with life and its, and its demands. I own a business. I get it. I totally get it. I don't have any employees now, but I, we once had 30 employees. That's a lot of people to deal with on a daily basis. This has to be numeral uno. And anything I put in front of my program, I will lose. If I put women in front of my program, I will lose them. If I put making money in front of my program, I will lose it. And on and on and on. Let's continue. He was, I'm at the top of 40. First paragraph of 40. He was positive that this, that this humiliating experience plus the knowledge he had acquired would keep him sober the rest of his life. Self-knowledge would fix it. What knowledge is he talking about? He's talking about the knowledge of the disease, of the allergy and the mental twist. You might know that it's an allergy and a mental twist, but unless I, and I know this, unless I'm working my program, unless I am taking action every day toward a spiritual awakening, I will eat again. I will eat again. I've lost an enormous amount of weight. I have lost a little over a quarter of a ton of weight. I was over 700 pounds. I've lost a little over 500 pounds. I have lost over a quarter of a ton of weight. That's no guarantee that I'm going to stay in recovery. That doesn't fix me. I've been abstinent for 21 years. Now my abstinence has changed. There were foods I could eat 10 years ago that are not abstinent for me today. I walked out of the nutritionist's office at various junctures when they would take things away from me. So the rules change because as I age, as I get older and the disease progresses, there are foods that I can no longer consume. So abstinence has changed over the years. It's not going to protect me. Let's continue. I'm on page 40. We heard, top of the page, we heard no more of Fred for a while. One day we were told that he was back in the hospital 
this time he was quite shaky. So with all Fred knew and all his, you know, I'm going to do it myself and I know everything and I'm very successful at business. Some of you are very successful at business too. Some of you are attorneys and some of you are professional people and some of you are very not, are not those things. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Ask, ask uh, Chris Farley and Karen Carpenter and Mama Cass Elliott and ask John Candy. Ask them how their professional success helped them in their quest not to be killed by this disease. And as long as we're on the subject of COVID-19, what is the number one factor that mitigates the severity of coronavirus? Extreme morbid obesity. Nothing will kill you faster than extreme morbid obesity. The problem is, is that it's a very, very painful death. Very, very painful. Very painful. We heard no more of Fred for a while. One day we were told he was back in the hospital. This time he was quite shaky. He soon indicated he was anxious to see us. The story he told is most instructive for here was a chap absolutely convinced he had to stop drinking, who had no excuse for drinking, who exhibited splendid judgment and determination in all his other concerns, yet he was flat on his back nevertheless. Now think about this. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how simple or smart. It doesn't matter how beautiful or plain. It doesn't matter whether you're white or black, Jew or Gentile, Protestant or Catholic. It doesn't matter whether you live in Dublin, Ireland or Dublin, Ohio. It doesn't matter whether you live in Geneva, Illinois or Geneva, Switzerland. It doesn't matter. You could live in Scottsdale, Arizona or Scottsdale, Illinois. Yes, there is a Scottsdale, Illinois. Yes. I'm from Illinois, I know. No, trust me, I know Illinois stuff. I know Chicago. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. If you have this disease, you must work this program as if your life depends upon it because it does. You must work this program like your life depends upon it because it does. And as you age, it is going to become more and more critical, not less and less. Let him tell you about it. I'm in the middle of 40. I was much impressed with what you fellows said about alcoholism. What did they say about alcoholism? It's an allergy of the body and a twist of the mind. And I frankly did not believe it would be possible for me to drink again. That's the action of the ego. The ego makes me different. I rather appreciated your ideas about the subtle insanity which precedes the first drink but I was confident it could not happen to me after what I had learned. You've learned plenty. If you're not working the steps, you are going to eat again. If you're not working the steps, you're gonna eat again. If you're not expanding the level that you are working the steps, if you are not expanding your workload you will eat again because the disease is getting worse over time and your workload has to increase. I wish it was different. You think I want to take all these phone calls I take? No. You think I want to listen to all the stuff I listen to on a daily basis? No. You know why I do it? I don't want to eat Almond Joy bars. I don't want to eat Almond Joy. I don't want to eat Kentucky Fried Chicken because I want to have a life that includes me not breaking furniture. I want to have a life that includes possibly a woman that would be with me in a relationship so I don't have to get up every day alone, go to sleep every day alone. I would like to have somebody share my life with me. 
And women are no different from men. They want something nice to look at too. They don't want a 485 pound guy to look at. They just don't. And we're the same as them. They're the same as us. They just don't. I reasoned I was not so far advanced of most, as most of you fellows. There's that ego again. That I had been usually successful in licking my other personal problems. Many of you have licked a lot of other personal problems. You've raised families and you've established careers for yourself. That didn't keep you out of the food. That I would therefore be successful where you men failed. Again, I'm better than you or I'm worse than you. In recovery, you learn to look right at the person. I'm no better than you. I'm no worse than you. I'm another bozo on the bus. And that's what I want to be. But my ego tells me I'm not as good as you or I'm better than you. And those are false, false, false pieces of information. I am the same as you. I don't care who you are. We could put each other on the, on the spot. There are things you're going to know that I don't know. And there are things I'm going to know that you don't know. And we need each other. And we are each other. What you learn in recovery is doesn't matter how beautiful you are or how not beautiful you are. As I say, whether you live in Dublin, Ireland or Dublin, Ohio, it doesn't matter. We are each other in so many areas. I have a friend and you do too. You have a friend who lives in Dublin, Ireland. Maria, she's wonderful. And I've had many conversations with her. I do, what do I have in common with Maria? Nothing. She's gorgeous. I'm not. She lives in Ireland. I live in Arizona. But when I hear her talking, I hear me coming out of her mouth. The way she thinks about food, the way she acts about food, the way she reacts to life, I hear me coming out of her mouth. I had the fortunate experience of spending some time with her both in Newark, New Jersey and here in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we have chances to talk to one another. I absolutely hear me coming out of her mouth. You wouldn't think so if you looked at the two of us side by side. I hear me. Maybe she hears her, her coming out of my mouth. I couldn't tell you. I don't know. But I hear me coming out of her mouth. What do we have essentially in common? Nothing. What do we have essentially in common? Everything. Every, absolutely everything that I would therefore be successful where you men failed. I felt I had every right to be self-confident, that it would only be a matter of exercising my willpower and keeping on guard. And how many of you have exercised your willpower and kept on guard and kept your calorie counter in your pocket and you went and you ate food that you swore to God you'd never eat again and there you were eating it. That's this disease. That's this sickness. It, in this frame of mind, I went about my business, and for a time, all was well. In other words, his first encounter with these alcoholics got him scared sober. And maybe you've been scared sober by the doctor, or you've been scared sober because you got an invitation to a wedding and you knew that there would be people there that would criticize your weight. So you went on the diet and you lost all the weight. And did I happen to mention today that losing weight will not fend off this disease? I might have mentioned that. I hope I did. I had no trouble refusing. For a time, all was well. I had no trouble refusing drinks and began to wonder if I had not been making too hard work of a simple matter. See, he's cruising now. He knows he's got this down. He's already resisted the urge to drink three, four times. He knows he's got this mastered, right? And how many of us have done that? We've been on the diet now. We've refused those chips ahoys a few times. We're the master of our domain. One day I went to Washington to present some accounting evidence to a government bureau, probably the IRS. I had been out of town before during this particular dry spell, so there was nothing new about that. Physically, I felt fine. Neither did I have any pressing problems or worries. 
See, he had nothing that would attribute to his drinking that he could consciously bring up. But he was successful. Everything was going well. I have eaten railroad cars full of Doritos because things went well for me. Yes, I've eaten railroad cars full of Doritos when things didn't go well for me, no question about it. But the truth of the matter is, I have also eaten railroad cars full of Doritos because things went well for me. I got this down. I'm just going to eat potato chips. I'm going to eat Doritos. I'm going to eat fill in the blank. It didn't matter. I was going to eat. My business came off well. I was pleased and knew my partners would be too. It was the end of a perfect day, not a cloud on the horizon. I went to my hotel. This will be the last paragraph we're going to cover today. I went to my hotel and leisurely dressed for dinner. As I crossed the threshold of the dining room, the thought came to mind that it would be, a, it would be nice to have a couple of cocktails with dinner. That was all, nothing more. So the idea that he could have some cocktails with dinner is the same as the guy saying, I'm going to mix whiskey with milk, is the same as the guy who said, I'm going to rush in front of this, this fire engine. I'm going to get my adrenaline fixed by rushing in front of this truck or this car, is the same as the guy, a man of 30 who had been doing some spree drinking, and he was shaky, and he was dead within four years because he figured once he was successful at business, he could drink again. This is an illustration of the insanity of this particular disease. This disease is a form of insanity. And what is insanity? It is the opposite of wholeness of mind. It is when the mind is fettered by crazy ideas. And the craziest of all ideas for me is I'm going to the movies. So if I'm at the movies, some Raisinets and snow caps are just part of going to the movies. And if I wasn't at the movies, I wouldn't eat Raisinets and snow caps. But if I'm at the movies, I'm going to take the largest box of snow caps, the largest box of Raisinets, and eat them in the dark. And after all, no one is going to see me eating them. And if no one sees us, me eating it, it doesn't count. That is insane. That idea is insane. I ordered a cocktail with my meal. So in other words, after everything he knew, after all his self-knowledge, after all the things that these alcoholics had told him, he is now ordering a cocktail with my meal. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? But I've done the same thing. Then I ordered another cocktail. What caused him to order the first one is the mental twist. What caused him to order the second one? The physical allergy. Because once that first cocktail was inside of him, the physical allergy took over, which set him up with a craving beyond his mental control. He could not fend off this physical allergy. After dinner, I decided to take a walk. You can bet your life he was thinking about drinking that entire walk. When I returned to the hotel, it struck me a highball would be fine before going to bed. So now he's on his walk. He returns to the hotel, goes right to the bar, and orders a highball. So I stepped into the bar and had one. I remember having several more that night and plenty the next morning. He was under the gun of the physical allergy. I have a shadowy recollection of being in an airplane bound for New York and of finding a friendly taxi cab driver at the landing field instead of my wife. The driver escorted me about for several days. I know little of where I went or what I said and did. Then came the hospital with unbearable mental and physical suffering. Now we're going to stop for today and we're going to do Q&A, but before we stop, 
I want to make a couple of points. He was a successful business person. He had been more successful than most. He had every reason to believe that with what he knew and how he was going to apply his knowledge, he would not drink. He would not go back into the liquor. Yet he is drunk. Yet he doesn't know what state he, he doesn't know what world he's in. Because that all the knowledge in the world isn't going to help me. All the knowledge in the world isn't going to fend off the idea that I can eat Rice Krispie treats. I can eat M&Ms with peanuts. Obviously, the people that buy these other M&Ms, the ones without the peanuts, obviously, these are not Jewish people. I mean, any person that has... They're going to buy the peanut. They're going to buy the M&Ms with the peanuts. Why would you buy the ones without the peanuts? I don't understand that. I don't get that at all. That is that's beyond my con that's beyond my comprehension. But anyway, seriously, the bottom line is is that it doesn't matter whether you're from Dublin, Ireland, or Dublin, Ohio, whether you're from Scottsdale, Arizona, or Scottsdale, Illinois, whether you're from Geneva, Switzerland, or Geneva, Illinois. It doesn't matter whether you're black or white or green or yellow or Protestant or Catholic or Muslim or Buddhist. It doesn't matter whether you're Jewish or whether you are an atheist or an agnostic. The time is going to come if you are not working the steps that you will go back into the food because this disease demands it. The disease is unflinching. It demands the food, and you will only be able to say no so many times before you give in. You will not be able to continue to fight. And I hope that before we go, I'm just going to say this one more time, and then I'm going to turn it back to Maria for questions and answers. The work of the steps is vital, and then you must give it away. You will not get this program by absorbing spiritual information. You will get this program by transmitting spiritual information. You, if you've lost a lot of weight and you've had a lot of abstinence, that is not going to make the disease go away. Losing a lot of weight does not make the disease go away. I'm going to turn it back to Maria now.